Hello. <clears throat> Here we are again with our friend Swami Rama and lectures on yoga. We have been through the sections entitled What is Yoga? The section on Yama and Niyama and on Asana. We talked about Pranayama and this chapter following the sequence inward of traditional Ashtanga yoga, which is what this is about, is concentration. He titled the chapter, A Few Glimpses of Concentration. The mind of the average man is diffuse. Let's see, who do we have here? Oh, hi, there's a ma tree. Hi, Matri. Yo again, Johnny. I didn't put you in here uh, with me, Ma. I thought you wanted, I, you didn't tell me, so I didn't know. <clears throat> the mind of the average man is diffuse. And, well, of course, there's Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Roseanne. The mind of the average man is diffuse, one more time. He is not able to carry a single train of thought through to its desired conclusion, and his thoughts lack continuity. For his mind is greatly controlled by his body and the external stimuli that he receives in his daily life. In reality, however, the body is only a shadow of the mind. It is a mold prepared by the mind for its own expression, for the expression so the mind can express outward through the body. Thus, it is as absurd for the body to be in control of the mind as it is for a servant to be in control of his master. Concentration, consisting of bringing the scattered mind to a point of focus, concentration consists of bringing the scattered mind to a point of focus, for it is only through concentration that the mind can fulfill its real potential. In concentration, all mental energies are brought to bear on one object or idea. The mind of the beginner rebels against the effort to concentrate, for the untrained mind finds it difficult to focus its attention consciously on one object or idea for a sustained length of time. When the aspirant tries to slow down his thinking process, for instance, thoughts, resistance, for thoughts resist his effort to control them and flit through his mind at a hectic pace. His mind seems never free from thoughts. When one anxiety is removed, another immediately manifests itself and his mind remains distracted most of the time. Through imagination and fantasy, too, his mind diverts him from the object of concentration. Sound familiar? The real potential and glory of the mind is hidden behind a veil of instincts, impulses, emotions, moods, sentiments, whims, and fancies. So in order to understand how the mind is so veiled, we must consider what is meant by each of these terms. An instinct, for instance, is an involuntary prompting into action. All human beings and animals in this world have two powerful instincts, self-preservation and reproduction. Hunger arises from the self-preserving instinct, while lust is a manifestation of the reproductive instinct. Then, are, then there are three kinds of impulses, three kinds of impulses, impulses of thoughts, speech, and action. 
which are intimately related to the imagination, which can be controlled by using cultivated reason and willpower. Emotions, moods, and sentiments are interconnected but they have their separate roles in the mental world. An emotion is a combination of thought and desire, for emotions are desires penetrated by or merged with thought. Two basic emotions are love and hate, and many other emotions contain elements of these basic emotions. Reverence, for instance, is a compound of respect and love. Of the many possible sentiments, three, the three are the most important. The religious sentiment, the moral sentiment, and the aesthetic sentiment. But feelings and sentiments are illusory in nature and are deceptions created by the mind. This is beautifully said stuff, isn't it? Moods enslave the mind. In Sanskrit, the word for mood is bhava, and two important bhavas are joy or exhilaration and grief or depression. Normally, the mind is continually jumping from one bhava to another, and as a result, these currents and cross currents do not allow it to think of higher realms of experience. The only true beneficial mood is the meditative mood. And in this mood, concentration comes in a spontaneous, effortless flow. Whims and fancies are present in all human beings, and in extreme cases, they lead to eccentricity. Under the influence of a whim, for instance, the mind is trampled underneath resulting in misery. Fancy is a conception of the intellectual faculty, of a lighter and less imperious cast than imagination. It helps a poet, an artist, or a dancer, but not a student of yoga when he is trying to concentrate. Modern science tries to explain the modifications of the mind in a gross manner by attributing emotions, moods, and so forth to secretions of the endocrine glands, such as the thyroid and the parathyroid glands, pineal gland, and thymus. When they are absorbed by the blood, these secretions, according to modern science, play a vital part in determining the temperament of the individual. Yoga science, however, has a far more subtle explanation for the mind's restlessness, for it maintains that man can control his emotions through the control of his mind. Yoga science, therefore, focuses on our knowing, analyzing, training, and controlling both the conscious and unconscious mind, training both the conscious and con unconscious. For thousands of years, yogis have known that the conscious part of the mind, though significant in conducting certain important duties in the external world, is only superficial. The unconscious is far more important. The unconscious is far more important, for in it lie the motivations behind man's activities. This fact has been recently realized by modern psychology and research into the unconscious mind is finally underway. But there are many things that are not yet understood. In yoga science, an analogy is used to explain the mind. The mind is like a lake disturbed by the rising waves of thoughts or vrittis. The practice of concentration helps to still the waves, and when the thoughts are stilled, the aspirant can see his reflection in the water of the lake and realize his own true nature. Therefore, according to yoga science, man is not restricted to the three states of waking, dreaming, and sleeping. 
there is a fourth state called Turiya, the state of the superconscious mind. To achieve it, the student of yoga tries to concentrate and bring his mind to a focus, after which he can expand it to the superconscious state. The purpose of concentration then is to wash off all the aspirants impurities to gather together the dissipated energies of his mind and to lead his concentrated mind along one channel to the state of superconsciousness. Again, beautifully said, isn't it? In everyday life, we concentrate in many ways. We concentrate while inserting a thread through the eye of a needle and while driving a car through a busy street. This concentration, however, is called external, for it is something in the external world that holds our attention. Concentration or dhanana, as described by Patanjali, which is wrong six of the eight, is an internal mental process, not a muscular exercise. It takes place entirely within the field of consciousness and is directed by our will. In other words, through internal concentration, the attention of the aspirant is drawn to an object and is held on it through the use of his willpower. Continued attention leads to concentration. Important point. Attention leads to concentration. Continued attention leads to concentration. Attention is therefore a preliminary to concentration. There are two kinds, voluntary and involuntary. Voluntary attention is that which is directed toward an object or idea by an effort of the will. It requires willpower, determination, and mental training. Involuntary attention, on the other hand, is spontaneous. It is a common occurrence and does not demand any practice or willpower. It is particularly noticeable among children. Concentration, re concentration requires voluntary attention. Some modern teachers formulate and advocate theories which are designed to justify their own ways of teaching, sometimes even saying that meditation is possible without concentration. This is a false claim because concentration itself in an advanced stage becomes meditation. So we have attention leading to concentration and concentration leading to meditation. Later we will see that meditation leads to samadhi. So there's a sequence, attention, concentration, meditation, and samadhi. If the wandering mind is not brought home all the so-called meditational methods practiced these days will be futile. The aspirant should therefore understand that concentration is absolutely necessary, and he should not be swayed by teachings which suggest that concentration leads to tension. And there's a lot of this teaching out there. And, and it's appealing to our false identity, self, personality, mind, says, I don't want to have to do that. Now I'm going to follow a method of meditation that says, basically, I can just let my mind wander ad nauseum all over the place and call it meditation. And I have a guru that is sanctioning that deluded notion of meditation. So it's very appealing. There are definite techniques and processes which help in training the mind to concentrate. For instance, the student should have a definite time each day for this purpose. Let's see. There's, oh, hi, Yolanda. Yolanda is there. A definite time each day for this purpose. Morning and evening hours are best. Here in the ashram, we start our day with this practice at six o'clock in the morning, and we end the day at nine o'clock in the evening with this practice and have two other times during the day that complement it. Concentration should also be practiced 
under favorable circumstances. One should be alone and have de and have determined that he will not be disturbed for a certain length of time. The room should be quiet, clean, and airy, without pictures or paintings on the walls. Our meditation room is what Ma Tree calls a five-star cave. It's pretty quiet. There should be no drafts in the room. The light should not be very bright, and the temperature should be and the temperature should be moderate. Concentration should not be practiced immediately after a heavy meal as it causes discomfort and drowsiness. A regulated sexual life aids concentration. In addition, do not try to concentrate when you are physically or mentally tired and restrict your initial sessions to about 10 minutes. Listen to that, 10 minutes. And so commonly we think, okay, I'm going to sit for meditation for two hours. And we end up sitting for an hour or two and doing nothing but worrying and calling it meditation. Better to sit for 10 minutes and you c c bring the willpower together to stay focused. For example, on the breath, the feel of the touch of the air flowing in and out. About 10 minutes. Concentration is easy when the posture is steady. Concentration is easy when the posture is steady, when the mind and body are relaxed, and when the nerves have been purified by pranayama. And there is Jean. Hi, Jean. I always think of cleanliness when I say hygiene. It's, you know, hygiene. Hygiene is hygiene. Deep breathing with regulation of breath stills the mind. The postures recommended for meditation in an earlier chapter are suitable for concentration, or you may sit on a wooden chair with the head, neck, and trunk erect and in one line, legs planted firmly on the floor and hands on the thighs. Do not practice concentration in the supine corpse posture, Shavasana, as this leads to inertia and ultimately to sleep. This is one of the reasons it's very common. Some of those, I feel more comfortable lying on my back. Can I meditate lying on my back? Well, it leads to sleep. And so what we come to discover is that meditation lying on your back in Shavasana is actually a very advanced practice. It takes a long time to be able to lay on your back and not fall asleep and actually do meditation. It's a valid posture, but it takes an extremely long time, measured in years, to be able to do it without falling asleep. Namaste, Roz. Yeah, they got a ha-ha out of Gene. You like that, huh? Hygiene, hygiene. Hygiene, hygiene. The mind should be untroubled and free. It should not be occupied by worldly worries and emotional problems. This is the reason that we live a life of the yamas and the niyamas. This is the reason that we, we cultivate internal dialogue. It's part of the reason that we also do contemplation. When we do these practices, then when it's time to do this concentration aspect of meditation, we have a chance of being able to do it. Yes, it, various levels of free, Roseanne. When we say free, as you know, it's not just one final absolute freedom. It's freedom of steps along the way. So yoga science includes several methods for controlling them. The first is to assume an attitude of detachment, vairagya. One should gently close the eyes, withdraw the senses from the external world, and say to oneself, this is an example, who am I? Now, these words here, he's meaning this as an example, not a script for us to memorize. And there's, there's a ma tree free. Thank you, ma. So this is not a script. It's an example. And say to oneself, 
and he's got quote marks here, who am I? And imagine that you're pondering this inside, not reading a script. I am not the body, the senses, the mind, the emotions and impulses. See, if you read it, it's just, you know, body, comma, senses, comma, mind, comma, emotions, comma, and impulses, boom, 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 boom. We can read the words, but what we need to do is do that internally. And who am I? And I allow my awareness to go through my whole body. And, and, and there's a moment of insight right behind it that in my words says, this body is not who I am. And who am I? Senses. And I be aware for just a moment of smelling and tasting and seeing and touching and hearing. And I allow myself to observe for myself using my buddhi wisdom internally to realize who I am is not these senses. I am the one that is the consciousness operating outward through the senses. Who am I? Am I this mind that is doing this thinking that keeps generating all these words and all this drama? And I just pause and I think about the fact that my mind is constantly thinking. Who am I? Am I this mind? And I ponder that for a moment, be aware of my mind, and the insight comes from inside. No, who I am is not this mind. Next one on the list is, Emotions. And who am I? Am I these emotions, these attachments and aversions and angers and fears that keep coming up in relation to those other people in the world, generally often called them? You all know who I'm talking about, them. Are these emotions related to them, who I am? Now, this is just me speaking. And then the insight from the buddhi comes from inside and says, no, as strong as these emotions are, they are not who I am either. And the next one after the comma, the comma is, Swami Rama says, impulses. And so I say, who am I? Am I these impulses, these surges that wants to come outward and defend myself? or wants to come outward and do all these activities in the world, these impulses, I can feel the surge to do activities. I can feel the surge to grasp things and to move around and to speak. Is this who I am? And the wisdom of Buddha comes from behind that and says something like, no, 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 these impulses are not who I am. And gradually we start to find ourselves that I am in this stillness behind all of these, where Swamiji says, who am I? I'm not the body, comma, senses, comma, mind, comma, emotions, and impulses. And we, and then part still part of his quote mark is, I am the all-pervading Atman or soul. And again, I say to you, remember, this is not a script. You, you, you literally ponder your way through it like this going inward. Is this, who am I? Who am I? Am I this and this and this? And you use your own language, not the script on the text and not my script that I just pretended to do. I am the all-pervading Atman or soul. I am Atman. I am Brahman. Shiva hum. I am Shiva. I know this to be true. Christian says, I and my father are one. I am the divine light, your own way of saying it. I am pure consciousness, you ponder to yourself after you think about the body and the senses and the mind and the emotions and the impulses. How can these emotions and impulses disturb me? How can this happen? I am completely detached, non-attached. End of quote by Swami Rama. With these positive thoughts, listen to this. Here's the effect that Swamiji is suggesting. With these positive thoughts, comma, the impulses and emotions in the mind slowly wane. Wane, W-A-N-E. They slowly start to reduce and recede. This is what we're doing. And this is, remember, this is talking about how we cultivate the will to do the concentration. 
The second method of calming the mind consists of trying to be a mere witness to one's mental activity. Not easy to do, but extremely, extremely important to practice with. We all know that this is not easy to do, but but we can be aware that's where we're headed and we can slowly start to do this. Be a mere witness to one's mental activity. Comma, observing silently the thought waves arising in the mind. It's as simple as this. If I say to you right now, please think of a very close friend, and that friend comes into your mind. Please think of some place, some place of geography, some location that you really enjoy going to, in some place in the forest or the beach or a city or this meditation room comes to mind for you. If I say, please think of your favorite snack food, and Ma Tree thinks of either chocolate or mangoes or something like that, if I may use you as a playful example. And notice that I'm just playing that game that we are silently observing the thought waves arising in the mind. So Ma Tree thinks of me because I'm so much one of her favorites. She thinks of me and then she thinks of mangoes, and she thinks of this meditation room. And these streams of thoughts are just coming and coming. So li listen to the instruction here. The second method is trying to be, be a mere witness to one's mental activity. And I just said it that way to say this is a way that we can play with this, is literally inviting thoughts to come so that we can pretend to be practicing witnessing. We say, okay, thought come. Think of another person. Think of a person I'm mad at and a person comes to mind. Think of another person I have not seen in a long time that I'm looking forward to seeing again. That person comes to mind. Think of some place that you were that you visited 10 years ago and you still fondly remember it. And on and on and on. One of the things that pops into my mind often when I play that game is bridges. I don't know why. I'm fascinated by bridges. Maybe I was a bridge engineer in a past life. I don't life. I don't know. But but just intentionally allow your mind to stream like that. And it's good practice on witnessing thoughts. There you're doing it intentionally. And if we can do that, then when we're just sitting to calm the conscious mind, then whatever does come, we have a greater and greater ability to watch it, to witness it neutrally. One should not associate himself with the passing thoughts. One should m merely watch them flit by. Now, I will acknowledge here that if, you, if we have not played silly games like I just tried to do with you, if we have not played silly little games like that, and we just sit down and plop down our butt and say, I'm going to witness the thoughts, what we most of us or many of us get is all the troublesome crap going on in life. The people in our world who are troublesome, our past experiences that are troublesome that I can't seem to shake off, my bad habits, my addictive behaviors. And we say, well, this is not easy. I'm gonna just witness them. And what we end up doing is, we all know this, we end up dragged in them. And so instead of ending up with witnessing and meditation and concentration rather, instead of that, we end up with just another worry session. And we say, this meditation stuff is stupid. It's driving me crazy. I think all of you know this. I think all of you understand exactly what I'm saying. So play with it the way he's suggesting here. And gradually, we should merely watch them flit by. No attempt should be made to use the faculties of discrimination or will. And there should be no struggle for control of the emotions and impulses. Practice, just play, 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 play. That's what practice is, comma. But one should note carefully the degree and duration of conflicts of attention. Repeated effort, repeated effort will bear fruit. We may have been playing with this stuff for years and still feel like I haven't even done this yet. So I'm just saying pause and just keep playing with this stuff. The initial attempts, and initial attempts may go for decades, may be very frustrating. Only, listen to this, only patience and perseverance will lead to success. 
I have over last de- last few decades, from time to time, I have encountered a person who will tell me essentially this story. You know, I've been meditating for 10, 20 years, and and my mind is still driving me crazy. So I went to so-and-so teacher, and I said, my mind is driving me crazy. And I keep trying to practice mantra. And, uh, and my teacher gave me a new mantra. I've literally had people tell me this. I was given a new mantra, and this mantra has 100 syllables in the mantra. And so now it takes me so long internally to repeat and chant the mantra that there's no opportunity for those other thoughts to come in and bother me. And when I've been told that story, it was always in the early stages of that practice. It had just been given and practiced with a handful of times and say, wow, this is great. Now my mind, I'm doing all of this very long hundred syllable mantra And now these thoughts are not bothering me. But ultimately, it does not work. Listen to the part, the stuff we just read where Swami Rama was talking about how to become a neutral witness of the stream of thoughts. And if we do that technique that I just mentioned, what happens is we never, ever, ever learn the skill, the art of neutrally witnessing the thoughts going on in the mind. All we've done is learn a a bigger technique of how to block the thoughts, how to get them away, how to beat them away with a club. And that's not what we're trying to do. It's it's the wrong direction. It may work temporarily, but that's like going home after a busy, stressful day and turning on the television and watching stupid sitcom television shows. And at the end of the day, you say, okay, now I'm tired and I can go to sleep. And Boy, this is this is a form of one pointedness. It gets my mind absorbed in that stupid television show and and I'm lost. But it will not teach us how to neutrally witness with non-attachment. I know I'm kind of going off into a rant, but but anyway, uh, so that's where we are. The initial attempts may be very frustrating. Only patience and perseverance will lead to success. Hola, Nicholas. However, if the conflicts are insurmountable, listen to this. Here's a suggestion. It's a good one. If the conflicts are insurmountable, the practice should be halted and continued at a more suitable time. For there should be no sense of effort involved in any method of concentration. Listen to that carefully. There should be no sense of effort involved in any method of concentration. A couple minutes ago, when I asked you to think of a food or a favorite friend or a favorite place you like going, that was very, very easy, was it not? Effortless. Effort leads to tension, and tension upsets the nervous system and results in serious discomfort. So we must internally understand the the difference between the positive aspect of willpower that we were reading about earlier and this kind of effort that does nothing other than create tension. And there's no escaping the fact that we all need to ponder that, listen carefully, give it some thought, and understand internally that there is a difference. There's two kinds of effort. One is gentle, gentle, persistent, keep going, keep going, keep going. And the other is the struggle that like the hundred syllable mantra that is trying to block the thoughts and get them to go away. Anyway, effort leads to tension and tension upsets the nervous system and results in serious discomfort. And then we get up after an hour of doing that and say, you know, my meditation used to be good, but I meditated for an hour and it was not fun. That's because we did not meditate for an hour. We sat there and worried for an hour and we had serious discomfort. There are various types of concentration, gross, subtle, outer, inner, objective, subjective, and infinite, depending on the object of concentration. The choice of the object is an important consideration for if the object of attention is pleasant, it makes the task easier. In the beginning, one should concentrate. Now, this is as a, this is a, listen to this carefully. This is suggested as a training method. 
if you watch, if you look at that Udemy course that we may call on the summary of practices, one of the things that I put in there is a PDF file of, of a sheet of paper with a big circle like this and a dot in the middle so you can print it out and sit it. It's there to practice what this thing is here. But this is preliminary. Note this is preliminary. This is training ourselves. An external object such as, in the beginning, one should concentrate on external objects such as a point. That's the point that I just was mentioning. A candle flame that does not flicker. A photograph of Christ, Krishna, Buddha, Buddha or your guru. One could also choose a blue, red, or yellow flower. Or one could use a mirror and gaze at the mid space between the eyebrows in the reflection. The gaze should be steady, but there should be no strain on the eyes. And you're not sitting there trying to do this straining the muscles up here and doing it for an hour or two. Use it as use it as a method of training the mind and being one pointed. I can take this top of this little pen here and I can put it there and I could just gaze at it. And, and if I were to take my cell phone here, if I were to take my cell phone and turn the clock on and just simply gaze at this little stupid little pen cap thing for one minute, it would give me some training in the principle. Then maybe I can toss this aside, and then maybe I can do a, an easier job of paying attention to the breath in my nostrils without getting distracted out in here into the field of thoughts. Remember, this is preliminary. The gaze should be steady, but there should be no strain on the eyes. It should be held only for a minute or two at a time, but this may be repeated two or three times. Play with it, play with it. If this if this that we're going through here in this chapter on concentration, if this is sounding familiar to you and you still in any way find that sometimes you're struggling with your mind, run some of these experiments. Simply for a minute or two, concentrate on something out there. Uh, just over there uh, on the couch over there residing for the last couple of days has been a little bear. It's a little white bear with a Yoga Nidra t-shirt. He's the Yoga Nidra bear. And so he just caught my attention there as I was just sitting here. So I could easily just sit here, leave my eyes open, and hang out with my bear who's sitting on the couch over there. It's a gazing practice. It's, it's, it's a help at one point in this. And if I gaze at, my, as, at the Yoga Nidra bear like that, gradually after a minute or two, I'll feel the comfort, I'll feel the natural urge to close my eyes and just be concentrated internally. These are very, very simple practices to do, but nobody can force you to do it. I cannot force anybody to do it. Reading this book cannot force us to do it, but we have to have a playful attitude and, and experiment with this. Concentrate on something external and notice the effect that it's training your mind how to internally focus. It should be held for only a minute or two at a time, but this may be repeated two or three times. The early sessions should not last very long. Even if we're old dogs, even if you and I are old dogs and we're trying to new, learn new tricks, as the saying goes. Uh, Intensity of concentration is more important than duration of practice. Listen to that. Intensity of concentration is more important than duration of practice. That does not mean that I have to tighten the muscles in here and get cross-eyed staring at the teddy bear over there. I can do it in a very relaxed way. All I have to do is sit there and watch the bear. Now, sitting just beside the little stuffed toy bear is a stuffed banana. And beside that is a little plastic pig. We have a funny living room here in the ashram. So there's a little bear, then there's a banana, and then there's a pig. So if I'm looking at the bear and I get distracted into the banana, you see, I've lost my concentration. I don't fight, I don't struggle, I just stay with the bear. 
I just stay with the bear. And if internally I want to do this, or even externally, I can say, hello, bear. Hello, bear. And it's very gentle and it's very soft. And I'm trying to say this to you in this way that if you have not been playing with things like this, please, I beg of you, experiment with these simple concentrations of gazing. And then, like Swami Rama says right here, no more than a minute or two. You know, if you can even last, try to last a minute without looking at the banana sitting next to it. It is, it's just, it's a habit of our mind that I don't want to look at the bear, I want to look at the pig. And if I look at the pig, then I want to look back at the bear. This is what our minds do. So gently, gently, gently. Intensity of concentration does not mean in getting cross-eyed and getting a headache over the bear. It's very gentle. After a while, the time span should be slowly increased. It does not mean that today I do 20 minutes on the bear and tomorrow I'm going to do 30 minutes and the next day I'm going to do 40 minutes. doesn't mean that. It's not keeping score and keeping a clock. It's just we naturally, it naturally just happens. Ah, so you, you downloaded that PDF file of the dot, huh, Ro? Good, thank you. Glad you've enjoyed it. Hello. Hello, Ramanas. You see, I try to make these things easy for you. The nasal gaze and frontal gaze are also effective methods for developing concentration. In the nasal gaze, the eyes are gently focused on the tip of the nose, whereas the frontal gaze, the space between the eyebrows, is the point of concentration. There should be no violent or forceful effort involved in this practice and the duration of concentration be increased from half a minute or one minute to half an hour. Now, we do not need to go that far. He's trying to give a thorough explanation here. And so it's gazing at the end of the nose. It, it, it's hard to do. It's like, how can I be aware of the end of my nose without putting pain in the muscles around my eyes? We can do it. It's very soft and very gentle. I can feel sort of the end of my nose there. I, my, and my eyelids naturally go down a little bit, but I know when I do this that do not strain the muscles of the eye. So I'm not going to sit here and do this and give myself a headache doing this. I know better than that because I've been doing this for a while. But I can sit here just quietly, calmly, and be aware of the tip of my nose in the same way that I'm looking at the bear that's over there. Very soft and very gentle. And gradually then it becomes easy to be aware of the cognitive sense of touch, of the touch of the air coming in the nostrils. Anyway, he's just offering that as another alternative. There should be no violent or forceful effort involved in this practice and the duration should not be increased from half a minute to one minute to half an hour if you really, really want to stretch it. The method of concentration chosen should be based on one's temperament. But once the method has been chosen, the aspirant should practice it faithfully for at least three months. Only then will he begin to see results. That does not mean literally that I have to concentrate on the bear for three months. Probably for most of us, the easiest and, and optimum thing to do is the breath of the nostrils. So because, because it's not easy to be aware of this and the mind initially wanders, this is why we're using the gazing out here. It's like, okay, how can I train my mind? Okay, I remember, there's my little thing. I'm just gonna gaze at it for just a few seconds and I'm gonna toss it away. And now the thing that I'm wanting to concentrate on where he says here for a few months is this. And a few months turns into a few years and everything deepens and deepens and deepens. A question just went into my mind. Ain't concentration, ain't concentration the opposite of letting go? I mean, concentration to me feels like holding on to. No, listen to this. This is, and this is just a playful attempt, uh, Nicholas, to respond to you. 
if I am succeeding in, in gazing at the bear over there. I'm concentrating on the bear. Remember a moment ago I said, if I'm looking at the bear, how easy it is to naturally have attention, go to the stuffed banana beside it or the, or, or the plastic pig or all over this room. If other people were sitting here in the room with me, well, look what happens. Your attention goes to the other people. There's a television over there. There's these graphics on the wall. There's pillows. There's cushions. There could be somebody walking through this room, and there's not right now, but it could happen. So the blending of these two, Nicholas, the question you're raising is very, very good, very, very important. But the reason that I'm being concentrated on the bear is so that I can easily practice ignoring everything else. Notice the fact that if I'm if I'm staying with my attention on the little yoga nidra bear, that my attention is not on the banana or the pig or the cushions. And, and we notice this sometimes, we're playing with this, particularly in a place that is sometimes, like here, sometimes busy. Is there, is, the, is there the ability to stay concentrated on what I'm doing? And Matri walks through the living room. Do I have the ability to not notice her? You see, so that's the non-attachment part. And, and the, the concentration is a way to enhance or help the non-attachment. The ability to not be disturbed or distracted by everything else going on. The effect of this, the relationship of this to what's going on internally when I'm trying to deepen my meditation is that how do I train myself to ignore all of the trains of thoughts going on in my mind? Give myself concentration on one thing and then it helps to allow the others to go on. So if I'm sitting here internally and I'm aware of my breath at my nostrils, now I don't have to this point I remember earlier I said run an experiment and be aware of a close friend and then be aware of a location and then be aware of a favorite food. Well, that was a little game to get us to notice how easy it is to let something go. You think of the friend and as soon as you switch over to think of your favorite food, you forget your friend. So this is what the mind does. It naturally has thoughts coming and going and coming and going and coming and going. And we're trying to learn how to be concentrated so that we could ignore everything else. So I may be starting with my bear out here to help train my concentration. But when I'm sitting internally and I'm being aware of the breath at my nostrils, what I want to be able to do is that if other thoughts, the train of thoughts, the river, the flood, the tsunami of other thoughts and emotions and impressions that come from the unconscious, that when they come forward to me, I have the possibility of not getting sucked into them. All of the worries and fears and attractions and versions of life that come, and then I don't have to sit there worrying for an hour or two and then later labeling it meditation when I know that it's not. I hope this is making sense. This is the spirit, this is the spirit of it. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to come to the, yes. Gene says, is the memory exercise, the counting exercise, another way to practice is yes, absolutely. That counting exercise, when I first saw that counting exercise, Gene, I completely ignored it. I had run a couple month-long residential programs in the Rishikesh Ashram, and each time we ran into that in the book, Art of Joyful Living, I would, I would be, I would, respectfully acknowledge to the students in there, I've never done this practice, but if, give it a try and you may find it useful. And finally, I said, well, I keep saying that to people. I need to try it one day. And finally, one day I tried it. It's this counting exercise for memory. And I and it was only by doing it, I realized, holy cow, this is an incredible practice. And I had been ignoring it for years. I'm I'm guiding the retreat, and I'm telling people, give it a try if you want. I've never done it, but you may find it useful. And I had to finally, once I did it, I realized this is a profound practice. So good, me good memory, Gene. You remember the memory exercise of counting internally. And, yes, it's a profoundly useful practice. 
it may be it, that one also can be hard to do initially. And so maybe it's best done after a few sessions on the bear something external that we're just looking at, like the little stuffed teddy bear. Margaret will, will lend you a doll or a toy if you want. You know, she probably has some stuffed bear or something in there if you want to really, if you want to play it with a bear or something. But something external like that, it may be a good pre preparation. Since you're asking about the counting, I know you've been doing that. So yes, the answer is yes. That, that's a perfect uh, other example of that but then we want to go beyond the counting inside. It helps us stay focused while ignoring everything else. And then gradually you wanna to come to the breath at the nostrils and then come deeper and deeper and deeper. And as you all know, I often keep saying, well, you know, follow the ohm to silence. And that's what we're trying to do. So a thumbs up, good. And let's see. Adrian, uh, Nicholas says, yes, there's the effect that when we concentrate on something, attention, we're not on the other things, faith. Good, Nicholas. Good, good, good. That's exactly the point. That's what we're trying to do. In the types of concentration medicine so far, the eyes are open and focused on an external object. This is called trotica. And remember, please use trotica. Use the trotica, the gazing, as a training method. Don't let it become as best you can. Don't let it become your permanent meditation. And and if you try to make it too long at a particular sitting session, it can have the effect too much of too strongly allowing the deep unconscious to come forward. So it can happen, for example, that an old childhood, sometimes when I've heard it happen, a person will have an old childhood of, memory of an abuse come mind, come to mind, some really painful childhood thing. And this is not the goal of this trotica, but it can have a profound effect. It can be so concentrating that you get flooded with the unconscious and it can be kind of crazy making. So don't do that to yourself. Don't do accidentally. It works so very, very, very well. But use that. My suggestion is use it as a training method and don't try to stay with it for a long time. But ultimately, am I wrong in saying that the letting go, which is more important? No, you're exactly right. Ultimately, the letting go is what's important. But to just say let go is not easy to do. It's just not easy to do, and I think we all know that. So this is a way of experimenting with that. If I'm looking at the bear sitting over there, it's an easy way to gently practice ignoring bananas. It's a silly way of saying it. I acknowledge it's a silly way of saying it, but I'm doing it simply because I'm sitting here in front of this laptop, and over the top of the laptop, I just looked out here for something for my eyes to fall on to use as a pretend game so I could talk to you, and there was the, the, little, the little bear is sitting there, so I used him as an example. So it's a gentle, 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 but you're absolutely right, Nicholas. What it's really all about is vairagya, non-attachment, and that means letting go. In the types of concentration mentioned so far, the eyes are open and focused on an external object. This is called trotica. We now come to the methods of concentration in which the eyes are closed. Here, three means are used. One, concentration on a word or sound. Two, concentration on breathing. Three, concentration on a mental image. Now, I don't want to try to go through there, there, a lot of this here because there's some more pages and I don't think we need to go into a lot of detail because the principle is what's important. One is concentration on a word or sound such as the eternal word OM. And we all know that one. How many times have you heard me say, please follow the OM to silence. So uh, in, in a couple of the courses, we talk about Donana, I'm sorry, Dhyana, uh, Japa, and Vichara. I just posted a sample of that from one of the courses in the Satsang group just in the last couple of days. So if you haven't looked at that, go look at it again. So 
we we can use mo om as mont as meditation follow the om to silence we can use the om as japa as repeating and remembering om 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 we can use it as contemplation contemplation on the meaning of it okay you're welcome nicholas and thank you for asking i i love the way you asked and commented on this series it was very very good stuff there how is how is this different than focusing on a single mantra the, if you're asking Johnny about the Tradika, Tradika is Tradika. The bear is out there. The bear is not the same as a single mantra. Anyway, the three things he's talking about here is concentration on a word or a sound, such as the mantra. Two, concentration on exhalation and inhalation. While repeating a mantra or word brings to my soul, I can internally I can have Om coming in and Om going out. Concentration on a mental image also makes the mind steady. The image should be that of concrete, simple objects, such an illumined circle. It could be an illumined circle, a soothing light, depending on whether one is good at visualizing internally. Some people are really good at visualizing images. Others are not. It can be a written form of OM. It can be the OM symbol. And uh, where's my, where's the ohm? There's usually an ohm, brass ohm sitting around here. But so you can visualize an ohm in there. You can re visualize any religious symbol. You can visualize a cross. If you're a Christian, you, you can re visualize a Tao symbol. Now, I've never worked internally with meditating on the Tao symbol, but I quite like the Tao symbol. I just, I think it's a fabulous symbol. I like it a lot, but, I, but I've never worked with it as an internal image in that kind of way. Anyway, the three general categories he's talking about here is one is concentration on a word or sound such as OM, and two is coordinating, if it coordinates, OM does with mantra, with breath, and three is any mental image. When the eternal word or spiritual object is chosen by guru or comes in alignment, the, uh, this tradition is, is a Shakti tradition. So just by hanging out together, sometimes that Shakti spills over and Ashram may have psychic experiences such as hearing celestial sounds, smelling fragrances, or knowing the future when these techniques of concentration are used. All of these that we're talking about. They can happen naturally for everybody, but it gets it happens even more so when you're hanging out around a tradition that is a Shakti tradition. And so this it just comes. All the experiences are bright are milestones on the path. They help to inspire the person, but do not dwell on them or consider them to be an end in themselves. They're only byproducts. More advanced methods of concentration, like Ajna Chakra. The, the Divya Chakshu, the Divine Eye, the Anahata Chakra in here, the heart center, is another place. He's just given some ideas a lot. And eventually we run into the Bindu, which is extremely subtle. He mentions Sushumna in here, where we are, we're either sitting or we're lying down and we're breathing. We're inhaling up the Sushumna channel. With inhalation, we're exhaling with down the Sushumna channel, going down, imagining or finding that stream of energy, that stream of light with a soul going up and a hum going down or an om going up or an om going down. These are aspects of this concentration. Remember, this chapter here is entitled A Few Glimpses of Concentration. And so there's many. And eventually... We go up the tunnel. You know, you hear the thing, the light at the end of the tunnel. Eventually, we meditate on sound or light. We go up the tunnel. We find the point of light called the Bindu. I'm not going to read every one of these. Concentration is an aspirant's foremost duty. According to Adi Shankaracharya, the founder of Advaita philosophy, 
the aspirant's duty consists of two things, controlling the senses and concentrating the mind. Controlling the senses means they're not getting lost out there and concentrating the mind is the one point. And that's basically the conversation that Nicholas and I just had back and forth. So the concentration and non-attachment go together. Again, simple example, if I'm paying attention to the bear, then I don't get distracted into the stuffed banana or the plastic pig or the cushions or people walking through the room. I, I think I, right now I'm alone in the ashram, but it happens sometimes. It, it, it goes like that. Concentration is in opposition. I'm not fond of this word, but it's the opposite of sensuous desires. When the mind becomes free or desireless, free from dwelling on sense objects and their enjoyment, the state of dhyanam or meditation, the state referred to as nididhyasana by the Vedantins, is achieved. That is the state of meditation. So the concentration that we're talking about here today in this chapter was Swamiji is giving us all of this. Remember the notion that the work with attention can lead us to concentration and that state of concentration can lead to meditation. That's what this sentence is here. Concentration is therefore the master key which opens the gates of meditation. For prolonged concentration results in meditation. In fact, it is difficult to discern the dividing line between the two. The simple formula to remember, to memorize, literally, this is useful to memorize. Write it down on a piece of paper and keep it around you for a while if you haven't already done this. Attention leads to concentration. Concentration leads to meditation. And meditation leads to samadhi. Attention, concentration, meditation, samadhi. Without concentration, the energy of the mind is dissipated in vague thoughts, worries, and fantasies. A disciplined person expresses himself more clearly through concentration. A man of ordinary intellect with highly developed concentration is more creative than the highly intellectual person of poor concentration. Through concentration, a direct link with the cosmic mind is established so that the mind can attend to several things simultaneously. Concentration is no substitute for labor or action, but it does assist the individual in gaining unique experiences and truths hidden in the deeper recesses of the mind. So we still do our activities in, in the world. If Jean is still her... Gene has to go feed the horses. Gene has horses on their ranch. You got to feed the horses, Gene. You, you can't sit around and always just be concentrating on the tip of your nose or a bear. You have to go feed the horses. Patanjali gave elaborate treatment to the science of concentration for he realized its utility in calming an agitated mind. Modern scientists now concur with this view and are convinced that only through concentration can one gather together scattered thoughts and emotion and resolve conflicts. If you're following where we are in our ongoing review of the Yoga Sutras uh, out through this, through this Facebook group that we're in right now, I think the next thing queued up to do is the section on stabilizing the mind through one-pointedness. We just talked about the obstacles that come and how a cogger one-pointedness is the antidote for it. So this relates to that. And next comes some examples from Patanjali on how to concentrate the mind. With steady practice, the nervous system and the mind are relaxed. And the mind then becomes steady, one-pointed, and free from the shackles of desire. The aspirant is thus led through concentration to the superconscious state where he experiences the bliss divine. So attention leads to concentration. Concentration leads to meditation. Meditation leads to samadhi, to samadhi. And beyond that is the Turiya that we're looking for eventually. So that's the end of that. And I'm going to put my little Matri bookmarker back in here and the cliffhanger for the next time we do this is 
mind and its analysis. So before Swamiji goes into a section on what is meditation, like today we talked about what is concentration. And, and so the thing that's logically next is what is meditation. But sandwiched in the middle is a little section that says mind and its analysis. So it makes sense in there. And so that's coming next. Then is meditation. And then is uh, a section on, on samadhi. Okay. All righty. Attention, concentration, meditation, samadhi. Yes, Roseanne. And then, of course, you don't need to put it in the list, but these are the parts that you and I do. Remember, these involve somebody called me. I have to do the attention. I have to do the concentration. And I am the creator of the meditation. And there's still a little bit of an I left who's going into the samadhi. And beyond that is the Turiya, which is the Atman. And there, there is no, there's not really an individual left. So I'm not trying to add a fifth one on there. Attention, concentration, meditation, and samadhi is the four to remember. And then you're going to naturally know that the Atman is beyond that. But this is the part, the eight rungs that we're going through that Swami Rama is talking about lectures on yoga is very, very, as all of you know, very practical. And practical means this is the part that you and I need to do. And that leads us to the doorway of the infinite consciousness, divine light, Shakti, God, however you want to call, Turiya, Atman. Very nice and sweet. Good. Yes, I, I agree with you. Thank you, friends, for questions and engaging. I know it, in some way it seems kind of limited, but I've noticed over the recent what month or two that as we're doing more like this, all of you collectively are doing a finer and finer job of wisely choosing what keys to push in the button. So it's it's facilitating the conversation. I still have the privilege of sort of getting long-winded at times, and, and I hope that it's useful. Yes, namaste, Roz, and uh, that's a good thought for everybody. Have a good day. Yes, have a good day. Have a good day and a wonderful meditation, and here comes the sales pitch. Where are we going? We're trying to go to the silence after the om. This is the ah, this is the ooh, this is the mm, and this is beyond. Om Tat Sat. Om Tat Sat. Bye bye, Voucher. I didn't know you were here, Voucher. I didn't say bye, Ramanas. Om Tat Sat. There's the Om Tat Sat. All righty. Bye bye, all. We'll see you maybe sometime tomorrow. Tomorrow is Saturday. And I think Saturday night, which or early Sunday morning, like two o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning. The U.S. changes time zones. So on, if you're not in U.S., if you're in U.S., this will be easy. Just remember to change your clock. But the, the 10 o'clock Sunday morning satsang will be an hour different for those of you who are, who are in Europe or elsewhere. And so anyway, that's coming Saturday night, Sunday morning. See you tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Nicholas. And let's let's go letting go, says okay. Dewey Dewey says Ma Tree. Dewey Dewey from Ma Tree. There's a bye bye Dewey Dewey from Ma Tree. Let's let her her Dewey Dewey. We will take her Dewey Dewey, not as just a bye bye, but an expression of love. If that's okay. Okay. Dewey Dewey, Ma. <laughs> Ma Tree's coming back in a couple of weeks. We get her back. We get her back here in a couple of weeks. And then I can sit here and talk about her wandering through the room while I'm doing this. But then when we're doing this, she tends to not wander around so much. Anyway, dewey dewey all. Bye-bye. Thanks for playing.